This week on WealthTrack, only six mutual funds have been run by the same manager for 30 years. This week's market-beating guest is one of them. Aerial Fund's John Rogers is next on Consuelo Mack WealthTrack. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Do you have what it takes to stay the investment course? Well, many mutual funds do not. Over the last 15 years, more than 58% of domestic equity funds were either merged or liquidated. Almost 52% of global international stock funds disappeared and 49% of fixed income funds did not survive as distinct entities. Long-term survival is especially difficult for the fund managers themselves. The Wall Street Journal's The Intelligent Investor columnist and WealthTrack guest Jason Zweig analyzed the situation recently using numbers from Morningstar. Of the 525 U.S. stock mutual funds that existed 30 years ago, 223 still are operating today. That is a 42% survival rate. But here's the clincher. Only six are still run by the same manager. In his analysis of the survivors, Zweig identified two key intertwined qualities, stamina and patience. As he wrote, stamina is the key to success and patience is the key to stamina. One of the six marathon mutual fund managers is this week's guest. He is John Rogers, founder, chairman, chief executive officer, and chief investment officer of Ariel Investments, the firm he started in 1983 at the tender age of 24. From the very beginning, on the masthead of his patient investor newsletter, Rogers has used the Aesop's fables slow and steady wins the race expression, along with the tortoise and the hare as symbols of Ariel's investment approach. In 1986, he launched the value-oriented Ariel Fund, which he manages to this day, now with the help of two colleagues. The fund celebrated its 30th anniversary in November of 2016 and has delivered 11% plus returns since the beginning, beating the S&P 500 by a percentage point a year and matching its mid to small cap value benchmark and placing it in the top 10% of all equity funds. I began the interview by asking Rogers to explain his and his fund's longevity. Well, I think part of the answer is that I did start young. You know, in 1986, I was just about 28 years old getting started. And so this has given me a chance to really build a track record over these last 30 years. But at the end of the day, your fund exists and stays in business because of the performance. And we've been able to show over this 30 years, 11.5% uh, a year compounded with all the ups and downs of the market and all the dramatic swings that we've all seen and experienced. I think the fact that we've been able to outperform and persevere has helped us to last a long time. I think also we've stayed very true to our philosophy around patient investing and our turtle logo. And right, really, slow and steady wins the race. Yep, slow and steady wins the race. And I think people have been able to see that we've been able to live those values and also be contrarian value managers. And so when you had the crash in 1987, we were in there buying. And when we had the internet bubble, we were being very cautious and conservative. And then when the financial crisis happened, and 07 and 08 and early 09, we were in there buying. So people have been able to see that we actually execute around the values that we believe in. So the question is, where did those values come from? Well, I think my strategy and philosophy came from partly you know, growing up as an independent person. I was an only child. I grew up in Hyde Park of Chicago, which is a part of the University of Chicago community, right. where they really do try to push you to think for yourself and to think independently. And I think that helped give me the confidence to actually start Ariel uh, in 1983 when I was uh, 24 years old. Now, I think the other thing that happened was I tried to read a lot. And of course, um, when I was at Princeton, uh, Bert Malkiel had written A Random Walk Down Wall right. Street. He was the chairman of the economics department. 
And I remember going to see him, and, and he really was the one that started me down this thinking that if you didn't follow the crowd, you could be a successful investor. That book had a profound impact on me. And then when I got out of college, I remember reading John Train's The Money Masters and reading about John Templeton. John Templeton. You know, and Ann Warren Buffett and Ben Graham, and those folks just sort of spoke to me. I just loved everything that they said, everything that was written about them. Uh, I loved watching them whenever I could see them on television someplace. So I think having those men as role models at that time in my life just had a profound impact on me. And being a contrarian and independent thinker, I, it just resonated with me. And is, is value investing by its very nature, is that a contrarian uh, approach? I think value investing is a contrarian approach. You're going to be buying when others are selling. Uh, when there's a lot of fear out there, you're going to be the one feeling confident going in and buying those stocks at bargain prices. But how did you, you know, the longevity issue, how did you survive given, let's say, the 1990s, the tech bubble, when you and everyone else, every other value investor, you know, underperformed? And, and looking at what's happened in the markets now, where if, unless you own the FANG stocks, you underperform the S&P 500. I mean, what, you know, what enabled you to survive and you know, be, have an independent firm? Well, I think a couple things help you to survive mm -hmm. these difficult markets over, over this now 34 years. Right. I think one is building relationships with peers that you respect a lot, that you can call and sometimes uh, keep each other's confidence going during those tough times. And I can remember uh, when times when we've been zigging when everyone else is zagging, to be able to talk to a Bill Miller, mm -hmm. uh, a Tom Russo, um, a Mason Hawkins. Right, Chris Davis. I remember, yeah. I, actually, I remember Chris and Bill tell, told me that they kind of had that what they called the value therapy group. It was because exactly. the world seemed to be going against all of you. Exactly. Yeah. You need that kind of value therapy group and those right. friends you can talk to. And, of course, you're always going to, try to find a way to talk with Warren Buffett and go to his annual meeting and watch him on television to get that reinforcement sometimes at tough times. But the other thing that helps that we try to do, and we've also borrowed from Warren, is to write about what we're thinking and what we're doing. And every quarter now we write a patient investor newsletter mm -hmm. to all of our shareholders and trying to reinforce with them this importance of thinking long term. And I think that we've been able to reinforce that over time so people are more likely to stick with us during those inevitable downturns because we've been able to make the case that if you think long term, you're going to outperform. And by communicating that strategy consistently and then executing it consistently, I think it builds confidence in customers. And what are the key takeaways that, that you've gotten from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, for instance? Well, there's a couple things they reinforce over and over again that I think are critical. And the one that I love is, you know, Charlie Munger often talks and Warren often talks about staying within your circle of competence. Right investing in what you understand. And um, he also talks about, which is a part of that theme, is waiting for the perfect pitch. Only swing when you get a swing at a company, when you find a company that you truly believe in, that you think has a deep moat around it that's going to stop competitors from coming in and causing all kinds of competitive difficulty over the long run. And with the Aero Fund, you run a pretty focused portfolio. It's about 40 companies. And, and you, do, you have low turnover in your fund as well. So how, how do you choose the companies that, that, you, that make the cut? Now, you really are looking for those companies that have a strong brand, a strong franchise, and they're in a sector where it's difficult for new competitors to come in. And we're going to constantly, constantly talk to our companies and the management teams about how are they going to maintain that moat over a five to seven to ten year uh, time frame. Right. And they say very few people ever are thinking that way. They say all of our competitors are coming in and asking about their earnings for the next five to seven or ten weeks. And for us to be thinking about that in five to seven and ten years makes us very unique and very unusual in the way that we do our research. Um, the other thing that we do is that we have our analysts now, they are focused on that first and foremost of understanding how strong and how deep that mode is. And they can't overemphasize how important that is. But at the same time, sometimes you're going to be wrong. Yeah. And so make sure that company also has that strong balance sheet to weather the storms if they do occur. And if you didn't quite get it right, at least the company isn't going to have a permanent you know, downturn where they're going to have a permanent loss of capital because the balance sheet failed the company. So I think that balance sheet strength is critical. That's one of the things, lessons we've learned over the years. You know, learned during the financial crisis that some of the companies that we thought were financially strong were not as strong. Mm -hmm. So we had to go out and figure out how we could recreate our whole process 
of understanding balance sheets and create another margin of safety, another layer of safety when we're doing our research, create our own proprietary debt ratings. And we think that's oh, really interesting. Yeah. So thinking more like a, a credit analyst, like a bond analyst, I mean, in, in addition to thinking like a tip and equity analyst where you're looking at the income statement, now you're looking at the balance sheet as well. And we, you're, 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 you're exactly right to say that we've decided that you know, often equity analysts are not very good at uh, being bond analysts. Right. You know, fixed income analyst. And Charlie Bobrinskoy, our vice chairman, worked at Solomon Brothers. Oh. Uh, he was there for over 20 years, and he uh, was an investment banker, and they were, they were experts at fixed income. They issued a lot of fixed income bonds, and he's brought that expertise to us and saying that was something he thought we could just do better. Mm -hmm. So he's in charge of sort of being our quality control to make sure that we've created our own proprietary debt ratings, doing our own original research, and understanding that you can't count on the sell side, buy side, research uh, that you often read on the street around, around the balance sheet strength of a company. And bond analysts tend to be much more pessimistic than equity analysts, and they also uh, you know, tend to be much more risk averse because they're worried about you know, potential default. Are, are you becoming more risk averse, <laughs> bringing that you know, type of analysis into the process? Or? Well, I think that we have become more risk averse over the years, right. you know, after you've been doing this 34 years, you learn a lot from your experiences and you learn a lot from your mistakes. Going through that financial crisis, it was a big lesson for us that companies that you thought had the financial controls to weather a recession, right. weather a difficult time, they really didn't. So it's something that we've had to learn the hard way, that to focus on the balance sheet is of critical importance, and sometimes our peers maybe are not as in-depth in that, that work. So being a good bond analyst and understanding the fixed income markets and understanding the credit default swaps and all the different ways that bonds are trading and helps you to understand the equity value of your company more effectively. Was there a, 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 an example of a company in the financial crisis that you thought was financially strong that turned out not to be, that, that you owned or or at least yeah. that the market treated much more poorly than you would have anticipated before the crisis? Well, during the financial crisis, our biggest mistake happened to be in one sector, and it was really the media slash newspaper sector. Oh, not the financials. It no. Was, oh. Yeah, we did fairly, we held our own there. Yeah. But what happened with the media sector, there's a couple things were happening all at once. Uh, Craigslist and some of the other internet companies were really destroying the classified advertising in newspapers. Right. We understood the circulation was going to be declining. We understood traditional advertising was going to decline. But the classified advertising was this high margin revenue for newspapers that just got devastated. So we missed that part of it. At the same time, the newspapers were all on acquisition binges. You might recall back during that time period that McClatchy bought Knight Ritter. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tribune bought Times Mirror. Uh, there were so many companies that were being bought. Lee, Enterprise, Lee Enterprises bought Pulitzer Papers. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, these companies had levered up right. as if there was never going to be a recession, never a downturn. And so you had the fundamentals of the business deteriorating, and at the same time, the economy started to deteriorate much more rapidly, and therefore their balance sheets were vulnerable because they had loaded up on debt to make these acquisitions. And even companies like McClatchy that sold off strategic assets to strengthen their balance, balance sheet, they hadn't done enough. So when I look back at that period, that sector really hurt us a lot. And companies like McClatchy probably were the most disappointing where the balance sheet just withered away and we lost the, had a real permanent loss of capital in that investment. Right. Uh, you know, disruptive technologies, it's, there seem to be a lot of them right now. Now with everything done through technology, you can have uh, balance sheets that are much stronger, generating lots of cash flow and don't having, not having all the risk that's in, inherent in a capital intensive business. So there's some real pluses to this new technology world that should add productivity to America and growth to our GDP that I think sometimes gets underestimated. But the part of your question that is important, I think there are a lot of brands that are really, really being disrupted. Right. In particular, the ones that we've been very concerned about have been all the retailers. Mm -hmm. You know, big, strong retail brands, it's under assault, it's unraveling so rapidly, and you wonder the future of a, a shopping mall right. and the big, giant retailers, and it's just going to be extraordinarily difficult for that to, uh, I think, succeed. Mm -hmm. And is, are, are you investing either a contrary to that trend or with that trend, or, um, I mean, you know, how, as an investor, is that a space that you want to play, or is it just too risky and too uncertain? 
I think it's too risky and too uncertain right. to get into these businesses where the internet is and the technology is coming in and causing enormous disruption. Our experience is that once that uh, ball starts rolling down the hill, it just rolls faster and faster and it gets more and more difficult to make it. And there's always people who are hopeful, who have a hopeful story and an optimistic story, how it's going to be different this time. Mm -hmm. But I just don't see it. And so we've been very cautious when we see that first disruption coming along. Uh, it worries us quite a bit. Right. What about the fangs? I mean, what about Facebook and Amazon? I mean, you tend to be a mid to small cap fund, so that's probably, at one point, they were, they were small cap and mid cap. I think the fang companies are extraordinarily well managed. You've got tremendous CEOs with great vision. And Warren Buffett often talked about that actually at the annual meeting again right. this year, how he missed some of those great stories, that he missed you know, the opportunity with Amazon and Jeff Bezos and how much money is left on the table. So those are you know, just extraordinary businesses, extraordinary franchises. The only issue, of course, is they've just got to be so large. Right. And uh, they're going to be harder for them to grow as rapidly at this size. And the valuations have gotten to be quite expensive in a lot of the names. And so I think it is a time maybe to be a little cautious and realize that that world can be disrupted again with newer technologies and you know these young folks in Silicon Valley are always coming up with something new and different and better and you know all these companies will not survive in the same way that they are today at least that would be my perspective right and and your analysis as, as far as looking at the moat and the balance sheets and everything else is that a reason why Facebook or Amazon wouldn't have made the cut at Ariel? Like Those fast-growing technology companies are not our, our cup of tea. You know, they're not in our circle of competence, and it's very hard to see how that's all going to play out. And, and so what, what is your, let, let's talk about what your cup of tea would be, your, your circle of competence. Um, what are some of the companies in your portfolio that are emblematic of the, of the Ariel approach? Well, one of the things, you'll, you'll see that a big space for us is the alternative investment area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been fortunate to serve on a lot of investment committees, and I'm on the University of Chicago Investment Committee, and I uh, used to be on the Princeton Investment Committee, and it's just fun. You learn a lot, mm -hmm. and you get to see a lot. And you know that all of these endowments and more and more pension funds are putting money into alternative asset classes. Right. So we have big holdings in companies like KKR. You know, they are the preeminent brand when it comes private to equity. Pri private equity. Right. More assets are going into the private equity than ever. The performance has been terrific for the long term. KKR has great performance specifically, and the stocks are quite cheap. Mm -hmm. It's sort of unbelievable to me how cheap they are, even when you uh, see the great brand that's there and seeing all the asset flows throughout the world going toward more and more private equity. It's enhanced by the problems that the hedge funds are having. Right. Hedge funds are struggling. People are more and more resistant to pay the 2 and 20 fee structure to uh, the lower returns that hedge funds have provided over the last 20 years. So KKRs are biggest in the alternative asset space from a equity standpoint. We also own a lot of the real estate asset plays. Right. So Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, JLL it's called, uh, CBRE, mm -hmm. the old you know, Richard, CB Richard Ellis. Right. And um, those are wonderful businesses where they do the real estate leasing, they do the outsourcing for real estate of giant multinational companies, but they also do investment management for pension funds and endowments where they will manage real estate assets uh, for oh. those types of institutions. So they do it all kind of in the commercial real estate space. They do everything in the commercial right. real estate space. Right. It's a wonderful business. The stocks are very, very cheap. People are too concerned that there's going to be a rollover in the real estate market and right. people won't buy and sell real estate anymore and the capital markets business will not be as strong. But they're forgetting about the geographic diversity that CBRE and JLL have. They're not understanding the, the product diversity. You know, now that they have leasing and outsourcing and investment management to go with traditional capital markets. So those companies are really well positioned and think they're you know, terrifically, been a, been, you know, a terrific spot. And then finally, I would just add, a, a, you know, Northern Trust is kind of seen as a stodgy uh, bank, but you know, they are a huge money management operation and they do so much of the back office for mutual funds and the custody for large pension plans and endowments. And it's a worldwide business, and they are preeminent at that, doing a lot also with wealth management. Yeah. And the main thing about Northern Trust, you know, they're not dependent on the traditional you know, spread income. They're not mm -hmm. you know, the big lending company. So all these are companies that are going to benefit from this sort of, again, um, this asset management happening throughout our world where people need to you know, pay fees to get alternative assets uh, out there performing for them. Let me ask you, you mentioned cycles. <laughs> Where are we at this point? I mean, we're you know, nearly eight years in 
to an economic recovery, and it's this, I think it's the third longest economic recovery on record so far. How concerned are you about the, the current uh, maturation of the cycle? I'm not concerned about where we are in this market cycle. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had this remarkable re recovery that started under President Obama's leadership in 2009. Right. You're right, it has lasted quite a long time, but we still are nowhere near euphoria. We think we can get GDP growth to be much stronger than people anticipate. You know, more than that three and a half percent kind of range is what I'd be looking for. Really? I mean, but we're like one and a half to two percent now. So where's that extra I think some percent, of the, the, percent and a half coming from? Yeah, the extra growth in GDP growth yeah. will happen because partly the momentum from the, you know, what's been happening. Mm -hmm. Consumer confidence will start to will continue to grow. Uh, people out there in the industrial sector will feel more confident. That's going to help with growth. But I also do think that as we have more infrastructure spending, that seems to be bipartisan support for more infrastructure mm -hmm. spending. I think there is a lot of support for having some regulations sort of pulled back and having a, a, a less regulated environment. Right. I think that'll be kind of a big deal. It is for business. Right. 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 And, and no matter what side of the aisle you're on, or if you're conservative or if you're liberal, lower taxes in the short term will be a boost to the economy. So all those things coming together after all the great work of the prior administration you have these extra, what I would call, icing on the cake mm -hmm. that will help boost the growth of the American economy. What if they don't happen? Well, I think a lot of the new kind of economic stimulus things that are out there maybe won't happen as fast as people had anticipated. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of drama in Washington. There is. But eventually, people come around to doing the right thing for America, to strengthen our economy, to provide the jobs and growth that we need. So I think that you know, common sense will prevail. <laughs> And people will come together and do what's right for the country. I know it doesn't feel that way today, and I get that. But, you know, you go through cycles. And right. Warren Buffett often talks about that. You go through the last century, you know, you had world wars. Oh, and absolutely. Had great depressions and all kinds of challenges that our country faces or faced at the time. So I think this will pass also and right. we'll get back to some From kind of your lips to Washington's ears that common sense will prevail, John. I know. Exactly. Common <laughs> sense will prevail. It'll be, we'll get back to some type of normality. So a, a, a couple of more questions. As, as far as the level of the stock market, you are also pretty bullish now about the stock market and, and you, you mentioned that you don't think that we're, that a lot of people don't recognize the productivity gains that we've seen. Can you explain that? Well, I think part of our uh, disconnect with sort of the common wisdom is that people really don't realize that earnings can grow faster than people anticipated. And some of it will be because of some of the things like the infrastructure spending that will help. But right. Also, this realization that you can grow and keep inflation low because you have great, productiv pro great productivity gains coming out in this market environment. All this technology is going to make our country more productive. You know, there's so many things you can do on your phone and things that you can, you know, you'll have driverless cars, you'll be able right. to get so much done at once. It's going to make our country stronger, it's going to make us grow faster, and we'll be able to do it, I think, in a relatively low inflation environment, which is critical, because that will help keep interest rates very low. As long as rates are within some reasonable range of where they are today, P multiples are quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I continue to sit in meetings all the time where people say the market's expensive and we've had this great bull market and they forget to realize that these rates are historic lows right. and therefore the stocks are not overvalued as long as rates stay within this reasonable range. And this also I have to say that when there's a common wisdom where everyone thinks the market's expensive and it's prime for a fall, typically that means that there's still, run, there's still room to run on the upside. Final question, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what do you think we should all own some of? For the long run, if I had to uh, pick one, one stock, I think it would be KKR. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that private equity is here for the long run, and to be able to this great, get this great franchise at a very cheap multiple, extremely well managed, and with all the assets around the world needing a, a haven and a place to be placed, I think KKR is very poised to benefit from that. So, John Rogers, what a treat to have you here in WealthTrack. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been fun. At the close of every WealthTrack, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is adopt some of John Rogers' slow and steady wins the race philosophy. 
Regardless of your age, most of us have a longer investment time horizon than we realize. The ability to stick with a well-thought-out, disciplined investment strategy is a key characteristic great investors share and one we can adopt as well. Next week, as we begin a new season on Wealth Track, why you might want to consider a donor-advised fund to maximize the impact and efficiency of your charitable giving. Pamela Norley, the president of Fidelity Charitable, the oldest and largest donor-advised fund, joins us to discuss the options. In the meantime, find out why John Rogers believes that not having email or even having a computer on his desk at work makes him a better investor. That's in our extra feature on our website, wealthtalk.com. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend, a happy Father's Day, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairholme Foundation.